Welcome everybody on Zoom, welcome everybody in the lecture hall, welcome everybody from the future. Um, so today we are going to uh, continue discussing cloud storage. We are going to discuss key value stores. I have to finish that. And then we'll start with uh, distributed file systems. I have the feeling it's too loud somehow in the lecture hall if I slightly diminish. Can you hear me fine like this? Yeah, okay. And if it's too loud, maybe the microphone is to uh, yeah like this would be better all right so i would like to start the uh, lecture by asking you a few questions about what we did last time and uh, then we'll uh, continue with uh, with the slides so i'm going to share my slides um, like this so the first question is which ones which one of these objects cannot be stored as an object on S3. Everything else can, but this cannot. So is it the first episode of Star Trek Discovery? Is it the 300 petabyte data set containing proton collisions released by CERN? Is it the static pages of a website or is it an archive backup of my two terabyte hard drive? Could it be that there's other microphones connected or something that this could be an echo? Yeah, maybe if we put it here. And the volume here, yeah. All right, we have 64 ounces coming in. Ninety-one. Hundred and six. All right, let's see what you answered. So far. And we have a majority, and the majority is correct. And the reason is that the maximum capacity, the maximum size of an object in S3 is five terabytes. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, what other questions do I have? This other one, this other question. So, can you tell me? what the best practice is among these ones. Is it better to first try, imagine it's slow, your system. So do you should you first try to scale out, then to try to make the, making the code better and then scaling up? Or should you first try to make the code better then scaling out, then scaling up? First scaling up, scaling out, make the code better. Or the other doesn't play any role. Yeah, one should just try everything. What do you think, which order? Take a look. We have a majority again. And the majority is correct. First, first, first of all, make the code better. Try to program it locally, accelerate it, make it as fast as possible on your machine. Then you can scale out with multiple machines, and then you can scale up with larger machines. All right, now we're going to move to the lecture, to the slides. All right, uh, cloud storage. Oh, what's going on? Did it, I think there was an issue. I need to share again. I think it's because I was resizing my uh, windows at the same time. Let me see if that works better. I don't know why the computer seems to be unhappy today. It's, uh, it's just... Uh, acting. Um, all right, now it seems to be working. Perfect. So let's continue then. Uh, so where were we? We looked at object storage, which is a great way to store images, videos, and so on. And then uh, we started looking at key value stores. And the main difference is that instead of storing, storing large values like images and videos, it's storing much smaller values. Remember, just like 400 kilobytes or something but the latency will be much better. Instead of hundreds of milliseconds, like we had with cloud storage, now we have just a single digit number of milliseconds. That's the difference. So we saw that the structure uh, is based on the key value model. Actually, it's the same for cloud storage. 
And in terms of abstract data types, if you, if you remember these lectures you had on theoretical computer science and programming and so on, abstract data types means uh, set, list, map, and so on. And here we have a map, right? As opposed to the implementation, that can be a tree map, a hash map, a hash set, and so on, right? These are the implementation details. Now, on the logical level, that's the beauty of a data independence, we have a map here but it's going to be implemented in a distributed fashion. It's not just a hash map, it's really a distributed hash table on a, on a large cluster. And so I started explaining to you how that works. We have all of these keys, billions of them, that we need to store somewhere. And the, the way we start is we're gonna hash the key, so these are cryptographic protocols. Uh, we hash the key and the output of that is some sort of 128 bit uh, uh, sequence of bits. Um, that is the hash of the key. And every key would go through that hash. And the hash has properties that we are used to in cryptography, meaning that it's hard to do it the other way around. If I give you a hash and you want to find out what key it was or give me a key that has this hash, it's very difficult. In fact, this is how the blockchain works. It's very difficult to create a hash that starts with a number of zeros. Um, and this is how we do it. So we, we, we create these bits and you know that this is uh, Z over... Uh, 2 to the power of 128z, which is a, a ring. Uh, and it's only a coincidence that it's called a ring and we represent it in, in this way, right? But it basically keeps starting all over again, right? Once you reach with only ones and you add one, modulo 2 to the power of 128, you get back all the zeros. So this is uh, the, the, the structure we get, but we really don't care that it's a ring. We don't care about the addition, multiplication, and so on. You don't have to worry about that. And what happens? is that the machines also get assigned a hash. And you could actually literally take the hash of some properties of the machine for that. So it also gives you some uh, sequence of 128 bits. And that actually virtually puts the nodes, the machines, on this little ring here, on this circle, randomly, because, you, the, the, because of the properties of the hash. So if we have four machines in the cluster, there will be one here, one here, one here, one, right? Now, how do we decide where the key values are going to be stored. If I have a key, where do I store it? Well, what's going to happen is that the nodes will agree to share the responsibility of ranges like this. Imagine that I take a key and I take the hash of the key and the, the hash takes me here. Then I go uh, clockwise, I always confuse clockwise, counterclockwise, so clockwise, and the nearest node gives me who is going to store it. If I was here, if my key has a hash that lands here, this is the node where it's stored. If it lands here, then this is the node where it's stored, right? So you take the key, take the hash of the key, look at it, go clockwise to find the next node you find in there. Uh, and that's where uh, the, the key is going to be stored. That's at least the start of the design. So it means that this node right here uh, that, I, that I put in a, in a square, is responsible for all the keys that have a hash that land in there. So in order to know, I start with that node, go counterclockwise to the next node. Anything in between goes on that node. Anything here goes here. Anything here goes here. Anything here goes here. So you see that now what I have done is partitioned my ring, partitioned my circle into intervals of hashes, and each interval of a hash gets into one of the nodes like this. For whom is that clear? Right, so this is the starting point of the design. Of course, that's not it, right? There's a few more things in there, but that, that's basically the idea. Do you remember the prerequisites that I gave last time? I said we need to be able, among others, to add and remove nodes very easily to the cluster. So what happens if I add this node right there, then it's going to be responsible this right here. This here is the old domain of responsibility of that node because that one didn't exist, right? So it has the whole responsibility. If I add a node in here, it kind of splits into that whole interval. And now only that part is still in there. And that part is newly handled by that node, right? So it assumes that the node didn't crash, right? It's just a, a transmission. So that needs to be transferred. Now, um, that's the initial design with one range. 
and uh, I could actually duplicate and store them at multiple places, right? So now I can I can basically uh, say that this node right here is responsible responsible. The original protocol that Dynamo is following is inspired by Cord, and Cord used to be relying on that kind of a structure. Uh, every node keeps track of the of the of the um, nodes at powers of two distances from the uh, from uh, from itself, right? So the next node, the node in two, the node in four, the node in eight. Do we have a problem with Zoom, with the transmission? It's lagging. Ah, that's strange. Ah, uh, because I'm online, right? I'm not even on Wi-Fi, so. Problem is to avoid being connected too many on the Wi-Fi or streaming. Like, for example, avoid looking at the the Zoom retransmission uh, over your phone at the same time. You can just look at me or look at the screen. It might be one way. I, I'm not exactly sure if this is how it works, but it might actually help. But uh, is it back to normal now? It goes again on Zoom. Just checking that you can follow. It's important because the recording is also based on that. So. Yeah, currently all right. Okay, very good. Thank you. It's just intermittent. All right. So, Cord. Cord, that's not Dynamo. That's inspired. Dynamo is inspired by Cord. So, in Cord, what you have is that the nodes uh, that is right here knows where the next node is. And what I call the Uber next, if you speak German, you know what that means, right? And, and then the Uber, Uber, Uber next, like the power of four, then eight, then 16. So it's basically all powers of two. And of course, you know, the power of binary search in logarithmic time, you're going to be able to spot uh, the right node, right? So this here is used to direct an incoming request. A user comes with a key and requests a value and you want to find out where it is or wants to write a value associated with a key. And in logarithmic time, you can find the right nodes with this technique. Logarithmic is actually nice, but the Dynamo team didn't like that because they also found it too slow and so they improved. They wanted something that is almost instant. So instead of using this, uh, uh, this uh, finger table protocol, what they do instead is that the nodes keep some, some preference list for every node interval. So they know the node intervals, the, or the, the, hash, the key hash intervals, if I want to be precise, and they keep a list for every interval of all the nodes that are responsible for it, right? Why several nodes? Remember, that's because of this, right? We said that we can have multiple nodes that can be in charge of the same uh, interval. Like here, the yellow computer is in charge of both the purple and yellow intervals, right? So we have this preference list. The first node in the list is called the coordinator. It's the most important. And then you have other nodes that might have a copy of the of the key value or that can be responsible for uh, writing a new key value, all right? And every node knows about the ranges of all other nodes. It's much more powerful than the finger table where it was only the power of two. Now, how is it shared? Because you need to store that somewhere, right? And now you have a bootstrapping problem because we are trying to store data, but in order to store data, we need to store that data. So it seems like we're back to square one and we're just walking in circles. But in fact, there is a whole domain of computer science in distributed systems where they have a lot of protocols that, do, that, uh, that can do these sort of things. And in fact, uh, I think it's called the gossip-like protocol or gossip-based protocol that the nodes are basically going to randomly uh, talk to each other and share information, and somehow it converges to uh, to uh, to knowing all of that. I'm not going into the details of this because there are plenty of lectures at ETH uh, on this topic on on uh, on uh, distributed uh, 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 systems. So so I'm not going in it, but just it exists. There are ways that you can actually use uh, use gossip protocols in order to uh, to to kind of uh, store these things in that way. So every node knows about all of the intervals and which nodes are responsible for what interval. And there are at least N nodes every time. N is a parameter of the system. When you configure it, you can pick the value of N you want. It can be three, can be 10, anything you want. And then you require that there are at least N nodes in every list right here. It's the number of replication, right? Now, 
The first node I told you is called the coordinator. And uh, when we read something, there's a second parameter we can configure. It's big R in addition to big N. Big R is how many nodes do you want to check when you want to, to read a key value? Maybe one is enough. You just want to, to get the value from whichever node. You don't really care. But maybe you, you don't fully trust that it's going to be consistent. So you might say, no, I want at least three nodes to give me the value because I want to check do they agree on that value or not, right? So then you could set R to three. And when you read, you really must wait until you get three answers in order to, um, to return. R can be chosen. It's up to you can be one, three, 10, whatever you want. And there's, there's a third parameter called W, which is the opposite. When you want to write and you write a key value, how many confirmations do you wait for? That's W. Do you want to, for, to wait for just one confirmation and then that's it? Of course, it will continue to replicate in the background, but after one, it returns. Or do you want to wait for two confirmations or maybe for 10 confirmations until you, you, you successfully return? Right, And then in the background, it's still going to propagate to R nodes, right? It's just that it's asynchronous, right? So W is the synchronous part, right? When you write, then you wait for that. And after that, it goes, it goes all the way to N asynchronously. And there is this requirement uh, for these parameters that you must have R plus W must be greater than N. It could be, for example, three, four, and six. That's just an example. Right, so you can just put whatever you want in here. All right, so then what happens is that when you have the request, so now we zoom out on the architecture. Yes, uh, in the room, in the lecture hall. Why should R plus W be greater than N? Uh, that's actually a good question. I didn't think about that. They just, they just require that. Um, let me see if I can figure out in just a few seconds. Otherwise, I'll take it offline. No worries. Um, what if we don't have that? Like I replicate it 10 times and then I only ask for one and I only write to one. I think it's probably that they came up with theorems that if you have this, then the theorems are fulfilled, the, the assumptions of the theorem. So you get guarantees on your system uh, in terms of eventual consistency and so on. So what I think is that if, if this doesn't hold, then you no longer get the guarantees that a key value store gives to you, right? It's not a detailed answer because I'm not getting in the theorems, but I think this is it. This is what gives you the guarantees mathematically. We have another question over here. Okay, careful, not in a single hop, gently, small hops. Small hop, you, you know what happened last time, right? When you did a single hop, okay. Gently, just two or three persons at a time of interval. Like throw, throw, Thanks. throw the mic. Yeah, okay, so go I ahead. Property is simply that if you synchronously write something and then try to read that value, you would like to know that you at least know if you read the wrong value. So if R plus W was less or equal to N, you could basically write to some nodes and then read from, a th read from some other nodes and you would never know that you didn't read what you just wrote. That's possible. So, so that was an explanation, right, for uh, for the question. I think it's the intuition makes sense. I think that goes in that direction, right? But I, I didn't think too much about it actually. Uh, maybe I can I can get uh, do some work offline to try to see if I come. But but this, I think it's a good intuition what, what you're explaining. That makes that makes sense to me. Thank you. You can throw back the uh, not not in a single hop gently. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's why we have small hops. <laughs> yes, okay. All right, so let's continue. So you see, I don't know everything. I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm a human being like everybody else. All right, so what happens? And we have we... one comment oh, also one on Zoom. On let's Zoom. Go. Yes, it gives you the guarantee that you read from at least one node who confirmed the last write. So I think it's just repetition. What you yes, of what you said. said, yeah. I think it's a good intuition. All right, let's continue then. So now if I zoom out, what's going to happen? You have the client that has a request, read or write. They are going to contact a random node, anybody on the ring. And then what's going to happen is that that random node, it has this uh, preference list here. So it's able to tell, given the range, 
uh, which coordinator we have. And that way you can forward the request to the coordinator. Then the coordinator is going to ask recursively to n nodes, the n that are responsible for the for the, the interval, and then it's waiting for answers, right? Then it waits for R if this is a reading request or for W if it's a writing request. All right, now um, we have a lot of advantages of this design. It's highly scalable. You can really have a lot of machines, thousands of machines. It's robust against failure. If, if a node crashes, then, uh, then, uh, then it continues to work. Even if it's a fatal crash, if it just crashes without even giving, giving a, an advance notice, it still works. Why? Because of replication because we replicate it. So even if a node suddenly crashes, it still works. So it's very robust. And the higher the parameters, the more robust it gets. And it's self-organizing, right? All of this idea of uh, the gossip protocol that's uh, highly decentralized. All right. But um, there are a few, uh, a few issues, though. We can only look up that's hash, the concept of the hash. You can look up a value, but you can lo not look up an interval of keys. Why? Because the hash would spread the interval over, all over the ring without any logic. So you cannot do any range search on the keys. Uh, you might have data integrity issue too, but we have uh, uh, some protocols in order to deal with that, like Merkle trees. Uh, and then there are also security issues that are orthogonal. So typically in big data, we assume that these computers are in your cluster. So you are in control and the security is your problem, right? That would be in contrast to uh, the blockchain, where you are really worldwide with computers you don't all trust. But here, we are assuming it's your data center and it's your computer, so you are in control. You might have a firewall again or, around this. All right. But we still have a few issues that we'd like to solve and that were actually solved. First, you might have an uh, uneven distribution on the ring. You might have out of luck especially if you don't have many nodes, they might be concentrated at some position, and then one node is going to have a huge interval of responsibility, while the others have little. Another problem you, have, you might have is heterogeneity, that some computers might have more CPU and memory than others. And uh, so we, we, we are basically asking ourselves, and that's part of the design, could we artificially increase the number of nodes to mitigate this, but artificially, not actually buying them, uh, and can we uh, can we have some more elasticity that takes into account the um, the, the the different uh, configuration of the machines? And so what we do is that we assign virtual tokens in here, and we just assign them to the machines like this. And every machine gets several tokens. Before it was just one, but now it's several of them, several hashes, and they are responsible for the corresponding intervals, right? So it's kind of virtualization. We separate between a logical token and a physical node that would be the machine, right? And when a node gets deleted, all you do is reassign the token to somebody else, right? If there is a crash, it's no problem. You get the data from elsewhere, but you can always reconstitute the data, right? And if a node joins, you just take tokens away from other machines and give it to the new machine, right? Now, um, there is an additional trick that's for time, keeping track of time. We have a question over here. Oh, over there. Okay. Yes, okay. you're getting better with time. Uh, okay, so in this case, uh, if we have virtual nodes um, and let's say we replicate using three and equals three, what happens if uh, one of the actual nodes, one of the computers, let's say, it's is big enough to store three virtual nodes, and then it fails. Do we lose the data? Uh, that might happen indeed, and this is why you need to be careful when you assign the tokens that you avoid concentrating them. So you try to spread the tokens over multiple nodes and avoid assigning twice uh, the same token to the same machine, right? Or, or in terms of responsibility. Uh, not in terms of tokens. So, so it's really, that's the way you assign these. Uh, you should avoid uh, basically intervals of colors. You, you should really try to spread the tokens all over the place. That's the idea. All right, did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, now vector clocks. Who knows a bit about special relativity? I don't have physicists come. Oh, some of you, okay. Because that's kind of the idea. It's, you know, that there's no absolute time, right? And uh, in special relativity, you might have some, some, uh, some uh, cases in which 
there is no uh, before and after, or not everybody agrees on that. So on a high level, vector clocks that I'm about to present are kind of a generalization to, to the relativistic case of, uh, of the clocks. But actually, that doesn't need to make sense to you because it's simpler than it seems. Um, the idea is that we have a system where we drop consistency. So it might be that at the same time, you have multiple values for the same key for some reason. And I will have an animation after that. And we need a way to keep track of the versions uh, in a way that helps us understand which values come after what value. For example, I have a first value that I store in node A, and I'm going to assign it a clock. So here is one dimensional, that's the easy case, that's t equals one, time is one on node A. And maybe I update it, and now I have a new clock that says that t is called, equals two, right? That's a new clock. Now it's linear, right? It seems linear because there is a before and an after. And so you know with certainty that the second version is newer than the older one. You can even throw away the older one, right? So you have this notion of comparability between of order between the two, right? Uh, so it's like absolute time. The problems start happening when you have a, a disagreement. And I will show you an animation with a network partition. It's really the CAP theorem, where in that case, for some reason, node A is not available. And now it's node B that is going to update to a third value, right? So the value I represent with this uh, circle, square, with colors, and so on. So since it's not B, it's going to imp increment the vector clock, but it's a vector clock, it's not linear. So now we have A2, B1, right? The increased B to one. If it was not there, then it was zero, right? Implicitly, we had B0 in the first two, now we have B1. And it might be that node C did the same thing without knowing about node B. So now we have A2, C1. So now you, you see, uh, you, you probably get some intuition of the order, that both A2B1 is larger than A2, if you compare lexicographically. So this is newer than this. This is newer than this. But these two cannot be compared. That's why, why I say it's relativistic. There is no more absolute time. So here we have what's called a conflict between the two. There is none, none of these is the, is the newest one. But we can reconcile the conflict at some point and put them back into a value like A3, reconciled by A, B1, C1. And now you can check that lexicographically three is bigger than two, one is uh, bigger or equal to one, and one is greater than zero because it's not there. And the same here. So now this here is larger than this and larger than this. So we, we have again, one single value in place. So there's no more conflict. For who is that clear intuitively? Right, and vector clocks are, uh, are basically dealing with this. It turns out, I actually discovered that uh, uh, recently that uh, one of the inventors of the vector clock is Professor Friedman Mattern, who was here at ETH. He's retired now, I think. But this was invented actually by, by at ETH. All right, just like Einstein, relativity is kind of a nice coincidence. Okay, so the vector clock is actually what we call a context. And you remember last time I told you that get inputs, they also take a context and can return a context. This is the context, it's the vector clock. Um, I will have an animation for this to make absolutely sure that it's clear. So in order to give you the animation, I'm going to assume a factor of three. It's just so that it fits on the slide. If I say replication 100, then, then that, that's going to be complicated. So factor of three. Here's my animation. So I'm representing the ring over there. Of course, it's a logical thing, right? The nodes are actually in a data center uh, piled in racks. So now I have these incoming requests that, uh, that I have key one. I'm always going to use the same key in there, right? Just for the, the purpose of this example. And I'm associating the value key one with the key one with value A, right? So these are values that I put in there. So I have this uh, preference list, right? And so I contact the cluster and it finds out that node one is in charge of the range of the hash range corresponding to key one, right? So probably it was somewhere in there, key one. So N1 is responsible and then we have N2 and then we have N3, right? Um, so this is my preference list. And what happens is that this is the coordinator, you contact it and then you write uh, uh, with a new vector clock N11, right? Because this is the first time that uh, we encounter it. And we store that value with that vector clock. We have a question. So how are the preferences chosen? Are they chosen at random? Do they have to exist for every key? What if we want to choose a new key for 
That's based okay. on the hashes. That's all based on the hashes. So it's the, what I showed you earlier when you assign the virtual tokens. Every token gets the responsibility for the n intervals yeah. that follow it uh -huh. counterclockwise. Right. That, that's how it's assigned. That's basically the size. Uh, and then the preference list are built on top of that with the gossip protocol. The, 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 the node starts gossiping on who has this value and so on. So and, and then it propagates. And at the end, you basically build that preference list structure. Right. Does it make sense? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand how we add, how we get like different nodes, like three, like three different nodes. If like a node is re responsible for one interval. Oh, no, no, that, that's yeah. the, um, I could, uh, let me see if I go back. Because I have the slide in here. So in the initial design that I showed you, every node has one interval, but then we had a change of design. We said we replicate, and now this node right here, this node is in charge, not only of that interval, but also of that interval. This node right here is in charge of that interval and of that interval. Now, if you focus on that interval right now, uh, right here, then it's both stored in here and it's stored in here. Right. These two get into the preference list, right? That's for this interval, all the keys in there have this node and this node in the preferences. So preferences just mean those nodes that are responsible for whichever interval we're in. Yes, that's exactly what it means. And so here, okay, this is why there's three, okay. Yes, here it's two, right? But yeah, then, then later it's three. Yeah, okay, it's a parameter, so you can set it to whatever you want. All right, awesome, perfect. It probably clarifies also in case it wasn't clear for other people. So, all right. So now I have my animation. So here I see key. The uh, N1 is the coordinator, uh, and uh, this is going to be uh, where it's stored. N1 is the one that takes care of it. So we put it in the vector clock, N11. And we put it in there. Don't worry too much about the notation because it. I, I think I realized I might have. Yeah. So at some places here, I used arrays with uh, uh, pairs with a node and uh, and a vector clock. In the book, I changed the notation of this to JSON-like format, just to make it clearer. But uh, that, that's not really that important. It's only a matter of notation. But basically, here I'm saying that for n1, t equals one. So the clock ticks on t1, and I store it here. And then what happens is that I duplicate it, right? So W might be two. So in that case, if W is two, then I replicate it twice, and then it returns to the caller. And then in the background, I replicate it a third time, all the way to N, okay? Then it's replicated three times. Now, somebody asks for the value. You just query the cluster, gather all versions. They all agree, that's perfect. Then you return this. Do we have a question? So is the coordinator the furthest in the ring when it's responsible for the ranger's replications before it? Um, it, it depends. So I, again, I, I warned you, I mix this counterclockwise clockwise. So it might be that some that in some slide I take the furthest or the first, but it's all based on these animations that I shown you, right? So every node is responsible for the next n intervals. Um, and so the, the coordinator node is really the, uh, I would say it's the closest uh, based on the based on the the size that I showed, would you agree it's the closest? You said the furthest. It's not really that important. It's it's really a matter of the, you know deciding the the direction. In the slide before with the arrows, yeah, yeah, it it might totally be that I got it upside down in some slides. That's because of this clockwise counterclockwise thing. Yeah, but you you get what I mean, right? Okay. I'll check the slides once more that I really use the same clockwise convention everywhere. Yeah. All right. So now we get back the value A, and that's actually great. It's all consistent in that case, right? Then let's say we want to put a new value. So we put back the context that we receive, which is the old clock. Now the clock ticks, we have two. We store it, and that's it. We replicate synchronously and then asynchronously. Now it propagates. Now we get it. We get back all the values. It's all consistent. It's actually beautiful. And we have B with its context, a unique value. Then we write back a value C, passing this, uh, this uh, context. It increments to N13. But here we have action. It's like in a Hollywood movie. You know, something happens. There is an earthquake or whatever, and it breaks here. We have a network partition. We didn't even have a chance 
to uh, replicate. But let's say W is one, so it's still returned. In that case, W is one. It just cannot replicate all the way to N during the network partition. I told you, you cannot have C, A, and P, right? In that case, we drop the C and keep the A and the P. It means that we are partition tolerant and we remain available, but we might not be consistent. How can it be? Well, now, if somebody asks on that part of the world, they do not know about the new value, so they are going to receive the older one, right, on that side of the partition, while people on that side would get C. This is why it's not consistent. You will not get the same answer from everywhere. So it's AP, but not C. All right. And now, even worse than that, we even try on that side to write back something, D, based on this uh, clock that we had with, uh, with, uh, on, on that side. And now we have N2, because that's N2 who is doing the writing. So it increments the clock by one, N to one. And, uh, and that's it. Now, oh, the network partition is restored. So did you go do a good job fixing it? So now we can propagate everything again and share it, right? Uh, so let's do, let's do a get now. We gather all the versions. And now you see A and B you can drop, right? A and B, they are old. They are older than C, older than B. But you still have C and D, right, that are left. So now I have a mathematical question for you, just to get you to think a little bit formally on what actually happens. My question is, mathematically, we compare these vector clocks, right? We compare them. It's greater, it's smaller. Oh, my computer is again acting up. Uh, it's Tuesday right here. Let's see this one. OK, so what do we call this, this relation between two vector clocks that can tell you this is larger, this is smaller, greater, smaller, or? Um, incomparable. Is it a total order? Is it a pre-order? Is it an equivalence relation? Or is it a partial order? So let's see. Ah, we have a winner. Actually, it's the correct answer. That's a partial order. So let's first get into what an order is. An order is a relation that satisfies three conditions. Three conditions. Does anybody know? Any mathematicians? Yes? Yes, anti-symmetric, reflexive, transitive. These are the three. Reflexive means that, uh, le let's call the order uh, smaller than. It's always true that x is smaller than x. That's reflexive. Transitive means if x is smaller than or equal to y and y is smaller than or equal to z, then x is smaller than or equal to z. That's transitivity, right? For whom does that make sense? Right. Transitive. And anti-symmetric means if I have x smaller than or equal to y and y smaller than or equal to x, then it implies that x and y are the same. That's anti-symmetric, right? Did I get it right? I hope so. Okay. So if you have these three, you have an order. Why do we not have a total order? Well, it's just because you might not always, it, the, the order might not always exist. That's the case between the, when we had this conflict here between the two. Then it's, it was neither true that x was smaller or equal to y, and that y was smaller or equal to x. Indeed, it, it's, uh, they are not in any order. So this is called a partial order. A total order, we would be, basically get a line. It would be something more linear, right? Um, we so have a, a question or a yes? statement. It's also a pre-order since every partial order is a pre-order. Yes, you are correct. Yes, yes. I, I, I should be careful and formulate my question even more precisely. Like, what is the most precise or cl closest mathematical object. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Sorry? 
Yes, exactly. I could actually even that's a meta that's a meta consideration that I could even use the, these orders on the on these uh, answers, right? Okay, but that would be pushing it. But yes, yes, the, the point made on Zoom is is uh, perfectly okay uh, because an order is a pre-order. Pre-order, if I'm correct, doesn't need to be anti-symmetric. It's uh, reflexive and transitive, but not anti-symmetric. But there is a trick to turn a pre-order into an order. You just take the equivalence relation when when, the, when you have these cycles, put them in the same bag, and then you have an order, right? That's the beauty of mathematics, all right? An equivalence relation, it's symmetric instead of being anti-symmetric. That's the difference with an order. All right, but that's just the math. And the idea is that when you have a total order, you basically have a line. Focus on the finite case. If it's infinite, you can have other things, but it's a line. And a partial order is what kind of structure? A directed, a cyclic graph. It's a DAG, basically. All right. And the, the reference to special relativity is that the causal uh, dependencies in special relativity, they are also DAGs. They also have these structures. All right. So now let's get back to the slides. Um, and again, if I did my homework correctly, I should get back exactly where I was. Yeah, except that it's, there, there was an update that seems to be resetting the uh, my, my size on the screen. All right. So, all right. So this is a partial order. And so we can compare and we can put a DAG basically here. And what happens is that I might have multiple elements that's called maximal elements. If I got it right, they are not comparable, but uh, they are not dominated by anything. So these are called maximum, maximal elements, maximal elements, as opposed to a maximum if you have one that dominates all others. So maximum would mean there is no conflict and there is one single value that is the newest of all. But in the case of conflict, you might have several uh, uh, maximal elements like here that are not comparable. Going back here, what happens is that we have these maximal elements in there. These are the ones that are returned, and this is my context. So I merge the context in that way, taking all the maxes, right? So I return C and D. And basically, I'm pushing the problem to the user. You know, I'm saying, okay, I have two versions. I have C and D, deal with it. So basically, I return C, I return D, and I return the context. And now it's up to the user to make a decision. How do you reconcile C and D? And basically, the user. Uh, so now we propagate again, and the user might, uh, we clean up also, yeah, a bit of cleanup, we're in Switzerland, and then we put back some value called E with the vector clock, and now it's going to be automatically uh, added here, and now we have a maximum, the conflict is gone, this value is higher than all others, all right. So we have an absolute maximum in that case, because the conflict is resolved. So I hope it gives you the intuition in here. So a few last words before the break. In Amazon, the architecture tends to be, we have plenty of services, S3 and so on and so on. Dynamo, DynamoDB actually is the service they give. In Cosmos DB, they have less services. In Azure, sorry, they have less services, but they tend to do multiple things. That, that's the case with Cosmos DB. So that's just a few a bit of intuition. So what did we learn? We simplify the model. We buy cheap hardware, lots of cheap hardware. We remove schemas and end up with something very simple. And somehow I just copied it twice, but it's actually exactly the same thing. All right, so this is the intuition. So cloud storage, key value storage. Cloud storage, we have big values up to five terabytes, but higher latency. Key value storage, the distributed hash table, we have lower latency, single digit milliseconds, but we have uh, smaller values up to 400 kilobytes. That's it for now. We'll take a break. And after the break, we will, uh, we will hello? Oh, yes, with the presentation. Uh, so let's take a break and uh, I'm going to stop the recording and see you on the other side. Please stay. We have ETH juniors with us today. They would like to, uh, to talk to you about what they are doing. Right. So I'll see you in uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 